Today, we are uh, being joined by Paul Napier, who is the president of the Cape May Raptor Banding Project. He has been banding raptors since 1988. He started out as a bird watcher and then discovered raptors and never recovered. Paul has traveled extensively in the US and abroad to learn more about the many exciting birds of prey that we share our environment with. Paul has been president of the Cape May Raptor Banding Project since the early 2000s when project founder and noted raptor expert William S. Clark retired. So before we begin, I just wanna go ahead and go over a few housekeeping items. Can we do next slide, please? Thank you. So for starters, uh, we do have um, closed captions enabled for this webinar. Um, to turn them on, you will see a button towards the bottom of your screen labeled CC. If you just click on that, it should turn the captions on automatically for you. Following the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A, so make sure to have your questions ready. And you may notice that for this webinar, there is a, a Q&A feature and a chat feature. For your questions, could you please kindly put them in the Q&A component just to limit the amount of notifications we receive during this webinar. And lastly, the webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you want to rewatch it later or share it with a friend, you will have that option available. All right, next slide, please. All right, so some of you may be wondering what connection the Nature Conservancy has with the Raptor Banding Project. Well, in Cape May, New Jersey, TNC owns and manages the South Cape May Meadows Preserve, one of the many locations where the Cape May Raptor Banding Project bands. Each fall, the project bands for several months to gather important data about raptors. They also give weekly live demonstrations and educational sessions at our preserve. These sessions are held on Saturday mornings from roughly September to November. Visitors can learn all about the different raptor species, and you might even have a chance to see one up close. Next slide, please. Oh, can we do next slide, please, Paul? I don't know, can you hear me, Paul? Yes. Oh, okay, there we go, sorry. <laughs> All right, perfect. So, you know I cannot co-host a webinar about bird migration in Cape May without shouting out our beautiful, beautiful preserves in the Cape May area. We own and manage the South Cape May Meadows Preserve and the Garrett Family Preserve. Each spring and fall, these preserves become a birder's paradise. In fact, 355 species of birds have been documented at our South Cape May Meadows Preserve alone. Migrating songbirds, shorebirds, raptors, and more fill the preserves. So if you're interested in birding, the best time to visit these preserves are during the second to third weeks of May and the second to third weeks of October. These are peak migration times as the birds are making their way to and from their nesting grounds. Next slide, please. So part of the reason why this area is such a birding hotspot is because of its location along the Atlantic Flyway, which is a major north-south flyway for migratory birds. This area is uniquely located in the southern peninsula of New Jersey, which essentially acts like a funnel for migrating birds. Our preserves and the Cape May area in general, which I have circled in red, serve as stopping grounds before the migrant birds have to make their journey across the Delaware Bay. Next slide, please. Can we do the next slide? Perfect, thank you. So like I said, during the spring and fall, these preserves come to life with today's topic, raptors. 
Um, I wanted to highlight these photos in particular. Um, this is just a small sampling of some of the raptors that you can see on our preserves. And these photos were actually all taken at our preserves um, by a local gentleman named Dennis Flanagan, who happens to be the photographer for the new Cape Bay Point Science Center. And he frequents our preserves regularly. So as you're gearing up for spring mig migration, just keep our preserves in mind. They're great for day trips, they're family friendly, and of course they are a birder's paradise. And while we're on the topic of raptors and spring migration, um, our Osprey camera that we live stream every year will be live streaming in the upcoming months. This camera will allow you to get up close and personal with our nesting ospreys, as well as some other raptors that might pop into the nest. We've seen Cooper's hawks, we've seen um, Shropshire hawks pop in, so it's a lot of fun to watch. So be sure to stay up to date with us on social media to find out when the camera goes live. And with all of that background information, I'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker, Paul Napier. Take it away. Thank you, Lily. Okay, and uh, my thanks to Lily for hosting this event and inviting me to come speak, and also to Damon No, a colleague of hers, for making sure we can get in to the Cape May Meadows every year to uh, operate our banding station where we trap and band raptors. So um, I warned Lily that uh, I have a sense of humor. So you see the uh, you see the slide here. Uh, eagles actually don't carry children away. They can't do that, even though there are probably some children that we would like to have carried away. Uh, but the point point of the slide actually is that when raptors are migrating through Cape May or elsewhere, they, they have to seek prey in unfamiliar areas. So it's, it's excellent that the Nature Conservancy preserves land like the Cape May meadows or other areas, forests, fields, marshes, et cetera, so that when the raptors are migrating, they look down and say, hey, that looks like uh, familiar terrain. There's probably a good mouse down there to eat, something like that. So habitat, A brief history of the project. It was founded in 1967 by Bill Clark, William S. Clark, and we've operated continuously since then, with one exception. In 2020, uh, we shut down because of COVID. We couldn't get into some of the land and had problems getting housing, so we just shut down. Anyway, 1999, we were incorporated as a 501c3, kind of became a mature organization. Uh, 2005, we began our consistent deployment of seasonal research techs. You've already seen uh, one of them in the picture there, uh, Laura Kwasnowski, and there'll be more as we go along. So we do that and get get uh, young people started on careers in wildlife. May, might be raptors, might not, but uh, at least some career with wildlife. And uh, I've updated these slides to show our total captures from fall of 2022. So we're over 157,000 diurnal raptors in 16 different species, and we'll see that as we go along here. <laughs> Although I assure you, I'm not going to show you 157,000 slides. Um, just an overview of how we operate. Uh, we are a fall migration project, so we operate from early September to early December, roughly three months. Uh, we're totally dependent on donations, public and private demos, uh, and we receive Possible. One of them has been off limits for a couple of years because uh, down at Higby Beach, uh, the uh, state is doing some remediation of the marsh, trying to restore the marsh down there. So uh, we, we've been uh, closed out of that particular area. So we have, have had three banding stations the last couple of years. Um, and those sites are all owned, the, the land. outreach um, with public demos and live raptors. I'm sorry about the screen interference here. I'll try to kill that. Um, and we do, so we do public demos with live raptors. You'll see that later on. And we also do many of these kinds of talks. I do lots of these. Uh, science, we have many science projects that make use of our trap talks and the data that we've collected. Um, I can't cover that in detail. We don't have enough time for that, but there are our numerous science projects ride on top of our data. Uh, species that we catch, 
We catch 16 different diurnal raptor species, or we have historically, and seven species of owls, and we'll have a little bit on owls uh, later on. There is an owl banding project that was started up in 1980, and they primarily focus on northern sawwit owls, so they mostly focus in late November and in November late October into November, because that's when those owls uh, migrate. Um, and just a note, our, our raptor banders, we're all volunteers. Uh, we each come up and, you know, spend a week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever up there operating one of the stations, catching hawks, uh, collecting data, and then turning them in. There's about 40 people in our 40 banders in our arsenal, so to speak. In some years, some of them can't make it. Some years, some people take two or three weeks up there. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you, it's kind of like booking a motel. You you book a week in advance as to which blind you get and you know where you're going to be. So, um, and the last note down the bottom there, loyalty, deep experience. Uh, my mentor has been banding raptors at Cape May for I think it's 47 years now, and he figures he'll go to 50 years and then retire. Uh, but there are lots and lots of us with 30 to 40 years or more uh, of experience. It's a terrific group of people. Alrighty, so here's some quick statistics here. <laughs> um, I put up the 19, the 2022 season uh, ending last fall. So you see up there notably highlighted in yellow, the most common hawks we catch are Cooper's hawks, 912, sharp shinned hawks in the upper left, 283. And those represent roughly 60%, roughly 18% of our total catch. And you can see some numbers over there farther to the right, the record years of those species um, and the totals over there, which are masked on my screen because I've got a picture of me over there. But uh, sharp shinned hawks are over 70,000, Cooper's hawks over 30,000, et cetera. Um, a lot of the reason for changes in this with time, where our numbers are lower now than they might have been earlier, is change of location or change of habitat where we operate our trapping stations. For instance, we used to operate years and years ago in the, the Cape May Meadows, but we operated right out near the dune, right out near the water. Uh, and it was great for peregrines, great for merlins. Uh, we now operate in farther from the shore, so it's less advantageous for those two, those particular two species, but maybe better for other species. So that motion of a couple hundred yards can make a big difference in what we catch and our our success rate for certain species. So anyway, I'll let you all kind of absorb this. I don't expect you to memorize it. I do note also down the bottom there, osprey. We used to catch osprey, uh, it says 17 total. We've stopped using the trapping technique that allows us to catch them. We haven't done that in years and years. Uh, it's basically a, a trap that sits up on top of a telephone pole and uh, kind of lassos them when they, they perch there. And uh, we just chose not to do that. So anyway. Uh, very impressive statistics. All right, let's go on here and York State, Pennsylvania, wherever, and they come down here. And the raptors do not want to fly over over the water. They Uh, up to the northwest um, and cross over up closer to, say, Fort DuPont State Park or somewhere where the, the crossing is uh, more narrow. So that's what that's all about. All righty. And we talked about public demos. This is not in the meadows. This is uh, one over at the Cape May Point State Park, but it's very typical. Uh, this is Ashley Lohr, our 2015 research technician there holding a hawk. And she's speaking to the public. Uh, there's a donation can right there uh, in front of her or beside her, I guess. And uh, you notice the audience. Um, the bottom there. One of our former technicians, Casey Setash, saw one of these demos when she was 14 and said, wow, that's really cool. I hope someday I can do that. 
And when she was uh, about 21, she came back after she graduated from college and she was our 2014 technician. So that's a, a case of a wish or dream fulfillment. She's off now getting a PhD. Uh, so she's uh, actually, I think she has it already. So she's a, a success story. Alrighty, now we'll walk through the raptors. And these are all raptors, obviously, that can be seen in New Jersey because we trapped them in New Jersey. Uh, that doesn't mean they're there all year, and it doesn't mean they're there in large numbers, but uh, they can be seen in New Jersey. So these are American kestrels. Um, these are some of the earliest migrants. They actually are migrating before Labor Day in late August, seeing them going through. We don't catch as many of them as we used to, one, because they're declining for some reason that's not known yet, although we're helping lots of people study that. And also, we don't get too many people that want to show up in late August and trap hawks. It's a very slow time of year, so a lot of people, a lot of volunteers just don't have an interest in that. So sadly, a lot of kestrels go by and do not get trapped and banded. Alrighty, here's some other facts about kestrels. They're small, slender falcons. Uh, you can see their breasts are mostly off-white color. Um, and they hunt insects, small mammals, and small birds. They'll also take lizards if they're out uh, in the right kind of area. Um, down to Florida, certainly they would be doing that. Um, and there are some sizes there. One thing about raptors, in general, the female raptor is bigger than the male raptor, um, sometimes by as much as 30%. So you'll notice that the weights here are uh, uh, not quite, they're not 30%, but they are, they are, females are larger. All right, as a small note down here, about 95, 94% of all the hawks we trap at Cape May are what, are what we call hatching year birds, means these birds hatched a few months before they migrated. So they might have hatched out of an egg or out of a nest in April, May, probably April or May, something like that. And here by September, October, they're flying south. So they've never done it before. They're not guided by their parents. They're just following instincts to fly south, um, which is rather amazing. But 94% of them are first year birds. Alrighty, another picture of kestrels close up. You can see the males have the, uh, the coppery colored back and the blue gray wings. And my assistant here has an excellent manicure. And here's a picture of a female kestrel. You can see the contrast. The wings are all the coppery and black color, no, no silver or gray. All right, moving up the ladder here to merlins. Merlins are the next size up in falcons. Uh, they are, as it says, intense and pugnacious. Uh, Bill Clark used to tell us that if you see a small, small bird in the sky chasing everything around and trying to bully it, it's almost certainly a merlin. They are very fast flyers. They can catch, chase and catch almost anything they want to. Um, and one, one note about uh, falcons, the three falcons we see here, uh, they have a notched bill at the end. It looks like a little wire cutter. It's not real visible in this picture, but you'll see one in a minute in another bird. Uh, so they actually catch their prey and seize it with their feet. And then they'll use their bill uh, to grab the the prey item behind the neck and snap its neck. Um, rather grisly, I suppose, but that's their that's their killing technique. Most other raptors kill with their feet, strictly with their feet, and their feet are their, their business end or weapons. Okay, and this shows a merlin. characteristic of a lot of young raptors that they're brown and buffy. They're not uh, not very colorful their first year. All right, and here's a distinction. You see an adult um, Merlin here on the left. See how it's blue-gray, blue-gray wings, and the hatching year one on the right, which is, has, as you just saw in a minute ago, has brown wings. Uh, and still the buffy, the, the one on the right has the buffy breast and the brown kind of teardrops down the front. Alrighty, now here's a peregrine falcon. This was the cover photo. Here you can clearly see the notch in the beak up front, and this, this bird has some mud on it. It was probably uh, killing a shorebird or something that was muddy. So, um, and uh, you can also see it has a little post in the middle of its nostril there on the beak, 
Uh, it's thought that peregrines, of course, dive very, very fast. There's a variety of statistics out there, but certainly well over 100 miles an hour. And uh, it's thought that this post breaks up the airflow rushing over the beak and allows them to breathe easier. Um, and I should comment that each of these species has their own niche of uh, when they when they migrate, the timing of when they migrate. So I, I our website, kind of the, the peak times of these various species that you can uh, uh, look at if you if you choose to do so. And just a, this is kind of a small story here about peregrines. One of our banders caught this uh, this peregrine. You can see the colored bands on it in the upper left here. They're kind of dirty and all that. But Uh, and we happened to catch it at, at Cape May as it was migrating. And in fact, within 24 hours, um, Ben Wurst down the bottom here showed us the baby pictures of that peregrine. So the point of this is peregrines are pretty well studied in, in New picture of a bird you've caught uh, you know, later in the season. All righty. All righty, and some facts about uh, peregrines. Again, uh, females are larger than the males, and you can see a difference like in the weight down there, 830 grams versus 578 look kind of kind of like that. All righty. Now we're moving on to a different uh, different category. These are excipiters. Uh, we have three species of excipiters we catch. This, we're starting with a small one. This is a uh, sharp shinned hawks. Uh, these used to be our most common capture, but because of change of where we're working now, we don't catch, they're not our number one Uh, water rising water levels and other other changes made it uh, impossible for to con us to can you continue there. So we've moved out. Um, sharp shinned hawks are bird hunters. They have long legs and long toes, as you can see there in the lower right. Uh, gives them the reach to snag passerines out of the air. So it's kind of like a basketball player. It's good for a basketball player to be tall. It's good for sharp shins to have long legs. So they can reach out and catch warblers, titmice, sparrows. That's here's some sizes. And again, a comparison, left-hand illustration is a young sharp shin with brown on the back. And the right is a, a more adult one sometime later and it's molted into the blue-gray back. And uh, you can't tell it too much there, but they tend to get, their eyes get deeper orange and even into red as they as they age. Um, and a small note down too, there, I commented on the sideways before, but uh, the adult sharp shins migrate later than the hatching year hawks. So the, the young birds are flying along first and they have no nobody to go. One is uh, Cooper's hawks. These are the uh, these are the most numerous ones we catch now. It was uh, whatever it was over fifty percent of our catches are Cooper's hawks, um, and they start arriving particularly in large numbers in early October. Uh, there was a time years ago where I had the record for catching the most of most of these in one day. 
and it was like 47 of them and uh, that's been eclipsed uh many times since then but uh they're uh, they're very common here in october and they're more robust than the sharp shins they're they're larger heavier they have heavier legs thicker toes you can see the the foot down there they also have the long toe and the long leg they they catch probably 75 80 percent birds but they will catch small mammals as well um you know certainly mice chipmunks that kind of thing they can uh, the bigger females could even catch squirrels. Um, probably not real common, but uh, uh, primarily they're primarily bird catchers. And again, you can see the discrepancy in sizes there where the females are uh, notably larger. And after you've handled these for a while, Uh, just by the, the size and so the girth of it, so to speak. Sorry about all the interruptions here. Okay, and adult Cooper's hawks molt slowly into this. This is an adult male. It's a gorgeous photo, but you can see the blue-gray back, the sort of uh, almost pink uh, along the cheek and around the chin, and you see the blood-red eye. Um, that's typical of very adult uh, male Cooper's hawks beautiful bird. Okay, going up to the next size up, the next size exhibitor are northern goshawks. These are uh, among my favorite hawks. This is a hatching year bird, you know, again, brown and probably brown and buffy. Um, they weigh, they can weigh as much as a red-tailed hawk. Uh, they're very, very aggressive. Uh, and they're predators of both birds and also mammals. It says down the bottom there, they're particularly fond of grouse and snowshoe hares. So if they can't catch a grouse, they'll catch a hare. Grounds like uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Canada, that kind of thing. They may have to come south to find food. Um, and so, we we see eruption years like that periodically, and it's it's based on the lack of prey primarily. And here are older versions. Uh, the one on the left is curious. You notice it's got a mixture of blue and brown feathers in it. That to me tells me it's a second year hawk. It has kept some of the brown feathers, but but uh, molted many of them to have to replace them with blue gray. So it's sort of a in betweener. It's not you know not a pure adult yet, not pure uh, you know third year or whatever. And there's another one over on the right. You can see some of the patterning on the breast. It's uh, little vermiculations, very fine. It almost looks like calligraphy on the breast, is the way I've described it. And very large feet. If you see that in the image there, these are very neat birds. And a couple more images of them. And the one on the right, again, has a mixture of brown and gray feathers mixed together. So that's not a full up adult yet. And the one on the left looks like it is. It's purely uh, blue gray. Alrighty, uh, Northern Harriers. We catch these in the, maybe in the dozens, 50 or 60 a year, something like that. Uh, these are interesting birds. They're unique. You know, it's a unique species, but you'll notice it has an almost an owl-like disc around it uh, made out of feathers. Well, they, like owls, they do use their hearing to try to locate prey in tall marsh grass. So they listen for squeaking rodents, particularly uh, uh, meadow voles. They listen for them and they, of course, can see them. And they have very long legs to reach down in that grass and try to pull out particularly the vole, or it could be a nesting bird or something else, but they're they uh they love rodents. Uh, these are these are gorgeous birds. If you handle one, you see that they're all leg, all wing, because they they, they fly slow and hover, so they've got to have big wings, and they're very lightweight for their size. Their their proportions are unusual. And here's another another picture of them. And here you can clearly see the facial disc. Um, and you see the marsh grass in the background there. Ready, moving up the ladder here. Now we're going to get into the Buteos. So this is a red-shouldered hawk. We catch maybe 20 of these a year, probably fewer than that, maybe a dozen. Um, 
one of the women on our project has a uh, project to put transmitters on these. Uh, she has a rather ambitious goal of how many she wants to put transmitters on. So I, I told her to make the project successful, we'll probably have to uh, catch them, have other people catch them and then provide them to her to put transmitters on because she alone will probably not catch the quantity she wants. And indeed, we were doing that this past season, catching them and turning them over to her to, to receive a, a satellite transmitter. And moving up one more notch, we have red-tailed hawks here. Uh, we catch a large number of these. Maybe uh, the record, I, I don't know what the record is. A good year would be maybe 400. A medium year would be 150 or so. I think last year, I don't remember the statistics. It was under 200, but a goodly number of them. Um, these are larger birds, larger than the red shoulder. They're larger than any of the birds we've seen so far. And they're, they're quite sturdy. Uh, one of the things that I admire about uh, red tails is they're so adaptable. Um, you probably many of you have read that they nest in Central Park in New York City. They nest out in the Mexican deserts, up on cacti and so forth. They nest in Alaska, all across Canada, every every state except Hawaii, well down into uh, Mexico and so forth. And part of the reason for their adaptability is they they can catch and eat almost anything. So anything within size range. So bunny rabbits, squirrels, mice, birds, lizards, snakes, um, you know, it just just so very adaptable. Um, and their their wingspan um, on a, a good sized bird, they might their total wingspan might be about four feet. Uh, these are very common. I'm sure many of you have seen them lots of times. And this is an oddball photo. It's uh, That's my hand. I'm actually holding the bird with one hand and photographing it with the other. Uh, the, the joy of uh, automatic focus cameras that allows that. Anyway, good sized birds and very adaptable. Okay. Excuse me, Swainson socks. Uh, Swainson socks are primarily a western species. I've seen them out in, oh, let's see. Uh, primarily Idaho, but uh, uh, other places out west as well. Um, and that's where we primarily think of them, and also Western Canada, I should add. But there is a small population that migrates down the eastern U.S. each fall. We catch a few in Cape May. We haven't, haven't caught one in a number of years now, but we do catch a few. So they're obviously here. Places like Hawk Mountain and the Hawk Watch at Cape May see them and count them. They can correctly identify them. Not many. But there are some. And one of the great mysteries that we're trying to solve is where are they coming from and where do they go to? Because the ones in the West, let's say Utah or Idaho, they they migrate in September in huge numbers. Well, they'll, they'll go all the way down through Panama, all the way down to maybe Argentina and spend the winter there and then turn around and fly back. Well, so what about the ones that we see at Cape May? Where, you know, where are they coming from? Where do they spend their winter? There's a small population of them that winters down in the Florida Keys. We know that, we've seen them. Uh, there's another small population of them that migrates down and spend, spends the winter in extreme Southern Texas. Uh, Bill Clark, who founded this project, lives down there and sees them every winter and you know, knows about them. So are those the populations that come through Cape May and maybe go down to the Florida Keys or go down to Texas? But where are they nesting? Where do they come from? Well, we know we have one data point where we caught one of these Swainston socks in September, so hatching your bird, and then of course let it go. And it was found, sadly, dead uh, the next spring in Nova Scotia. So is there a nesting population of Swainston socks somewhere in eastern Canada, maybe Nova Scotia, maybe someplace else. And, you know, it may not be large numbers of them, but uh, there are areas certainly in eastern Canada that are not uh, highly populated. There might not be a lot of bird watchers there to notice. So, and we, we have an ongoing project to try to put a transmitter on a Swainson's Hawk so we can track it and learn this. But of course, as soon as we got that project enabled, uh, we have not we have not been able to catch a Swainson's hawk. That's kind of Murphy's law here. So uh, we're st still waiting, but the transmitters are ready. And there's another picture of Swainson's hawk. This is actually out in the, uh, uh, this is the Higby 
beach marsh that they're trying to revitalize now. So we have not been able to be in this site for a few years. Alrighty, broad-winged hawks. We catch a few of these a year, maybe one to three, as it says down there. Um, these are among the smallest buteos, smallest buteo in North America, smaller than red shoulders, red tails, swings, etc. Uh, we catch a few of them, as it says. But mysteriously, when I was putting together data, I saw back in 1981, we caught 113. I, th I thought that was a typo. So I asked some of the older guys and they said, no, no, it was 113. Dan here caught 30 himself. And we don't really have a, a good explanation for it, except they, they may have been uh, uh, suffering from lack of food or, or whatever, it might've been a drought and that they uh, were just doing everything they could to get food. Alrighty, and this is a rough-legged hawk. We catch very few of these, uh, as it says down there at the bottom. The last one was in 1999, but in 2017 we managed to catch two of them. Uh, one of them was in my blind. I had a, a old friend helping me, and uh, he actually caught it. Uh, but it's it's got my band on it. That's the one photographed over. Well, all all these pictures of that one. So uh, it's out there running around somewhere. These are birds of the northern tundra, as it says, an open taiga. They're, you know, Arctic birds, basically. And they do come south in some winters in modest numbers. You more likely read about them out west, you know, in uh, wintering in places like uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, up in the Dakotas, that kind of thing, or, or actually upstate New York, up near Canada. But um, occasionally they come through Cape May and occasionally we trap them as you see here. Moving up to the big birds here, we have bald eagles. Uh, we do catch bald eagles and golden eagles. Uh, the record year would be three eagles in a year, and it might be two of one and one of the other, or three of one or whatever. It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, one, one year, one of my buddies uh, down here caught three bald eagles in one week. Uh, on his own, which broke every, you know, all of our records for any one person to catch three bald eagles in a week. Uh, and he he has no idea how he how he did it. He was not highly experienced at the time, but uh, you know, it's like fishing. Sometimes you get lucky and so forth, and uh, take them any way you can. And the note note is here about the bald eagles. This is a young youngish bird. It's not an adult, obviously, no white head. But um, if you look at the size of that beak, it's absolutely massive. Uh, it's one way to tell a bald eagle from a golden eagle if you get a can get a, a good view of the head. And here's our founder, William S. Clark, holding a bald eagle. Um, and this gives you an idea of the size of the bird. You look at the size of those feet. If you remember all the way back to a sharp-shinned hawk and how delicate its feet were, and these, these eagles are uh, uh, certainly sizable. Uh, I have a photo, I, it's not in this talk, but I have a photo measuring, I don't know if it was this bird, but a, a bald eagle we caught, a hatching year bald eagle. And it's uh, four of us holding it. it. We have it down on the ground and one is holding the left wing, one is holding the right wing, one is holding the body and the feet, and the other person's holding a tape measure to try to measure the, the, wing, uh, the wingspan. So it took four people to do that. And here are golden eagles. You notice the beak is much more delicate on these, um, but they're, they have a similar intensity about them. There's no doubt when you catch one. And here's, here, here's another example of uh, uh, how many people does it take to hold a golden eagle? And this is not, a, not an extremely large one either. That's Arthur Nelson down the bottom there. He lives in Cape May. He's the one that caught it. And two people assisting, and that's Casey Seatash. Uh, she's the one that dreamed of becoming a technician and lo and behold became a technician when she grew up. Uh, and as I said, she's got her PhD now in something to do with wildlife. I'd have to check. I think it's with swans. Anyway, so they're uh, preparing to take some measurements and observations of the golden eagle. Alrighty, and I, I mentioned a couple times about satellite transmitting. This is old data. This is from 2018. But two of the early golden eagles we had, had transmitters on them. And this is their uh, spring migration. So this is them going back up to Canada. Uh, they're coming from Qu Northern Quebec. So these are transmitters put on by CTT down there at the bottom. Um, 
cellular tracking technologies. And Dr. Trish Miller is the one that puts on the transmitters. She's the one that does all the transmitters for us at Cape May. Uh, she lives in Cape May with Michael Lanzone, her husband, who's the uh, CEO of CTT, which has their business there in Cape May. Anyway, um, this is showing two of the birds migrating up in spring, getting ready to go back up to their nesting grounds. Uh, these particular transmitters work off the cell system. So when these birds, like you look at meadow up there, the, the aquamarine trace, uh, when meadow gets up there and gets a little farther north, uh, they, they go out of range of cell towers, so we stop getting data. Uh, same way with Love Swan. But when they come back within range of a cell tower, let's say months later in fall migration, uh, the the device on their back will store all the history of where they've been and download it in a burst to the uh, cell tower. So even though they're we, we've lost track of them temporarily, when they come back in range of a cell tower, they will dump the data and we will get uh, feedback. Uh, sadly, these two eagles have since probably perished. We've stopped getting data from them uh, overall. Uh, but it's important to note that with with raptors, the mortality rate is very high. It's certainly over 50% when they're young. As they get older, the more there's a higher survival rate year to year, but it's it's pretty high. Um, and these two almost certainly succumbed. And what do we catch at night? I mentioned we do have an owl banding project uh, run by Katie Duffy. She's still running it. I talked to her this last fall when I was up there. She's a retired biologist out in Yellowstone. She worked at Yellowstone National Park for many years, and she lives in that area, still lives out there. I also visited her there. And you notice the tagline down the bottom about catching the northern sawwood owls. Typically, she catches about 60. Uh, and for some reason, in 1995, she caught 600. And the other banding sites here in the east were similarly flooded. Uh, people were running out of bands. Uh, nobody had an explanation for this. It was just a, a really bumper year and did not repeat. Uh, it did not repeat that year or any year since. So who knows? It may have been that they, the adults had lots of young and then there was very little food for the young. So all of them had to fly, fly south and search of food. Alrighty, here's some statistics. Just got these from her a couple days ago. So you saw, see there that she got 87 in 2022. And there's that record year, best year, 637 in 1995. And you see the, the other years, or the other species are much lower. She's like us, she has changed where she bans the owls. Her owl banding station is out in the South Cape May Meadows, the Nature Conservancy property that they so well uh, generously allow us to work on. Uh, so Katie is out there as well at night. Uh, but the place she is trapping is she's not likely to see horned owls, barred owls, etc., because of the location. So while she's had good numbers of those owls in the past, moving to a different location has kind of filtered them out. Uh, same same scenario that we have. And in fact, she she showed me this year she's got nets up to try to exclude barred owls from there because they will come into that territory. Uh, the worry there is the barred owl will actually attack a saw wet owl if it's in the net. So you you don't want that to happen because you're, you know, uh, bringing about the demise of the, the bird you're trying to study. So she has large nets to keep the barred owls away and it it works. So, alrighty, that's the end of my talk, and I'm actually a little early, so we'll have more time for questions, and back to you, Lily. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Paul. That was such an amazing presentation. I do apologize to everyone about the technical difficulties. There were some bandwidth issues with the internet, um, but it seemed to have righted itself. So, like Paul said, we are going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A component in the, uh, the Zoom buttons down there at the bottom for you. All right, Paul, so first question we have, are the number of raptors declining like other bird species? Uh, it's difficult to say across all of them. For instance, bald eagles are, quite, are doing quite well. Uh, they've recovered from the DDT poisoning years ago. 
Um, so bald eagle numbers are up in general, but if you look at two other species, kestrels are declining. Uh, we don't quite know why. There are people studying them all across the United States, not just in the East, but all across. Uh, we've helped with several projects for that, providing data of sizes and weights. Uh, we've been providing feather samples so people can analyze the feathers to look for, you know, diseases or toxins or whatever. So we don't really know, but kestrels are declining and sharp-shinned hawks seem to be declining as well. Again, there is a disease that sharp shin hawks get called capillaria. We've been studying that, well, helping people study that for two or three years, where we monitor the birds, look in the mouth, and we're looking for, it's kind of like looking for cold sores. So we look look at that, record it on a, you know, a data sheet uh, to let people know how many sharp shin hawks have capillaria. And uh, so those are ongoing projects. Many of the other species are kind of holding their own. Um, it, the, the long-term fear or, or threat is habitat destruction. If you're a red-tailed hawk, yeah, you can live in Central Park, but that's not the best place for you. Uh, a friend of mine in this project studies urban uh, living Cooper's hawks in Seattle, and a large number of them they take in that are, are dead, that die, are full of rat poison. Um, so, you know, it's much better off to have good habitat, clean habitat, and no toxins. So, awesome. okay. Thank you. And this question is in regards to your um, slide about the stats from 2022. Um, somebody was curious what the recovery column meant. Okay, yeah, recovery has a sp specific meaning for banders. And that is when we catch a bird, we put a bird band on it with a unique number, like given a social security number, we and we let it go. Well, if it is recovered or found by somebody else, let's say somebody else is trapping raptors down in North Carolina, one of my buddies is, if he catches it and he records the band number, reports the band number to the federal bird banding lab that that, that holds all the data, then the banding lab will connect the dots and say, hey, Paul, the bird that you cat caught in Cape May was caught again in North Carolina. Here's the land latitude, <laughs> latitude and longitude. Here's the date, time, et cetera, and, and introduces me to the person that caught it and vice versa. <clears throat> so that's what a recovery is. Sadly, most recoveries are actually birds found dead, uh, particularly highway collisions, window collisions, that kind of thing. Or, or in, if you're a Cooper's hawk in Seattle, it might be because you're you're poisoned. But uh, so recoveries and encounters are the way it means the bird is uh, somehow encountered again, either trapped, found dead, or or sometimes they're found injured and taken into rehab facility, that kind of thing. Good question. All right. Next question is about the the northern goshawk. Um, does it spend much time in New Jersey, or does it mainly pass through? That's that's highly dependent on what it's doing. Um, they're they're mostly northern birds, as I said. Think Canada, New York State, that kind of thing. Um, if they're coming through New Jersey, first of all, it's in low numbers. They might sp they might spend the winter there. There's no reason they can't. Um, if for some reason they're they're not finding that to their liking, or you know, it's not a great habitat for them to catch food, they might go farther south. They don't go terribly far south in winter. Uh, the mid-Atlantic region, I live in northern Virginia, uh, I mean, it, it would be something like this or New Jersey, not much farther south. It's not the cold, I should have said this earlier, and this is an excellent uh, question to lead in with this, it's not the cold that drives raptors south, it's lack of food. So you can, northern, northern goshawks have no problem living in Canada, or living in you know Minnesota in winter, which is very cold, it's it's whether they can get food or not. And if there's no food there, not enough snowshoe hares or grouse, then they're going to move south. Um, so anyway, yeah, they could they could certainly be there in New Jersey. Small numbers in the winter. All right, great. So besides from size, what other ways can you tell the difference between a Cooper's hawk and a sharp chin hawk? <laughs> well. There's a the classic things you look at. The the Cooper's hawk has the appearance of having a larger head 
And it oftentimes it has its hackles up in the back of its head. So it looks like very square headed or block headed. Um, and it's it's more robust. It's just sturdier. Um, the sharp shin has a very small head. We, we jokingly call them pinheads because their head is so small. And if they're in flight, their head is not projecting as far out from the in front of the wings as it is with the Cooper's hawk. Um, and the other classic thing you hear is that sharp shins, typically the tail, the very end of the tail is square cornered and a Cooper's hawk looks more rounded. Uh, but some of that they can control by, you know, how they're flexing their tail or whatever. Um, if any of you are on Facebook, I am, there are Raptor ID groups and Raptor discussion groups on Facebook, and they will, people will post pictures and say, what is, what is this? You know, it's a picture I took in North Carolina. Is this a Cooper's Hawk or a Sharpshin Hawk? And you will see endless discussions. The good thing is that many of them are really good experts at identifying them, much better than I am. So you can, you can get smart really quickly uh, just poke around on use search for Raptor ID on a Facebook. Awesome. So another question here um, about how many male northern harriers have you caught? Are they harder to catch? Um, you probably you probably mean adult males, the so-called gray ghosts. Um, we don't catch very many of those. I caught one this past fall that was I think a second year, so it was not quite a full up gray ghost. Um, we catch, again, remember, we catch mostly hatching year birds. So we're catching a lot of these brown birds, like the one on the screen right now, uh, that are either, you know, they're, they're mostly hatching year birds. So not so many adult male harriers. Um, you know, that's less common. I wouldn't say they're harder to catch. They're just not as many of them flying through Cape May. A lot more hatching year birds. Gotcha. All right. All right. Next question. Um, it looked like some of the smaller species had huge eyes, even larger than the bigger hawks and eagles. Are they better hunters than the other species because of this feature? Ooh, that requires some thought. Uh, the, the answer is no, they're not better hunters because any species that was a lousy hunter would have died out long ago. But they, they hunt, you know, each species fills a niche and hunts certain things in certain places. So, um, you know, merlins, for instance, have fairly big eyes. Well, merlins will hunt at twilight. Um, we we kind of joke at Cape May about there being merlin madness after 4 p.m., where it's starting to get darker or, you know, dusk, and they'll be out hunting with their big eyes when a lot of other, the other raptors have kind of given up for the day. They're off perched and, you know, just waiting for night. Um, but, you know, it, it that's a tough thing to say because sharp-shinned hawks, they, they kind of look bug-eyed. That's one of the characteristics they have. And they're oftentimes hunting back in deep forest. Uh, they're hunting birds in dark areas. So having a larger eye and getting more, you know, more sensitive to the light might be an advantage but there's so so much that goes into that uh, you know I'd, it, it gets tricky generalizing uh because it, i mean you can take a sharp shin hawk and it has no trouble hunting in the bright sunlight nor does a merlin uh, they're you know great at that but some of the other birds are, are less less prone to be hunting in darker areas anyway good question yeah there's a lot of good questions today so next question is, um, are you aware of any banding or counting groups in Northern New Jersey? Yes. Do you know what they're called? <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the name of the, the, the project, but one of our banders bands in Northern New Jersey and has for over, well over 30 years. She was just emailing me the other day about, uh, renewing her New Jersey banding permit. Um, and curiously, she comes down and helps us in early September because she can't trap on her ridge in northern New Jersey because there are timber rattlers there. And the interesting thing is, so the property is closed. It's I, I guess it's parkland. It's closed and off limits to people until later in September when the timber rattlers have gone into their dens, you know, to, to uh, hibernate. Um, and it's not because they're worried that rattlers are going to bite people. 
It's because they're worried the people will disturb the rattlers. So it's to protect the snakes. Um, so she can't be up there working. So she comes down very generously and, you know, bans for a couple of weeks in early September uh, in Cape May. So th that's that's one longstanding project I know of. It's up on a, a ridge somewhere in northern New Jersey, but I don't I don't have the name of it. Uh, if people have, you can either look me up on Facebook or, you know, find my find my email address on Facebook. Um, I can I, I can either connect you to her or I can find out the name and location of her project. Awesome. Let's see. Here's another one. Often social media shares warnings that hawks carry away pets. Isn't it true that typical hawk, say a red tail or Cooper's hawk, can't lift and carry away anything that's heavier than they are? And uh, is, it fact, is it more likely a mistake? Um, yes, that, I mean, that's generally true. Uh, I have Cooper's hawks in my yard frequently. And actually, I've been in this house for 11 years. There's the, the window right behind me, the bird feeders outside. Cooper's hawks, every Cooper's hawk kill I've seen in my yard has been a morning dove. Uh, <laughs> they love morning doves. Um, but they, they can't carry away a cat. Uh, it's too heavy, or much less a dog. I mean, dogs are heavier. Um, and nor, nor can a red-tailed hawk. A red-tailed hawk might be able to take a, well, certainly a kitten, a very small cat, maybe. I don't know. I have a small cat upstairs at six pounds, but it's an indoor cat. It's not It's not going to see a red tail. Um, all bets are off, though, when you, you start talking about eagles, uh, bald eagles, and there are, there are bald eagles right in my neighborhood here. Uh, they, they could, you know, certainly lift up a small cat and go away with it. Um, probably not a dog. That's too heavy. Uh, and we don't have golden eagles here, but the same same would apply, you know, roughly roughly there. Although, to be fair about it, I've seen plenty of videos of golden eagles up in the mountains diving down the face of a mountain and hitting, um, say, a, a mountain, well, I'm going to say loosely a mountain goat or some kind of deer-like, goat-like animal, not necessarily in the U.S., knocking it off of a ledge. Uh, they don't carry it. They knock it off the ledge. It falls down and gets, you know, dies from the fall. And the eagle comes down and eats the carcass. So it, it, they're not carrying it away, but they, you know, they can they can attack things bigger than they are. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, next one is going to be, do you or did you ever use colored leg bands? Um, I personally have not. Um, uh, other people do. The advantage of that, and in fact, you saw the the peregrine with the colored colored leg bands on it. It's a great, great question. Um, you have to get approval to use those from the Federal Bird Banding Lab uh, for a specific purpose. Generally, that's done where there's a high likelihood that you're going to see that bird again, like say peregrines at a nest, where you may put a band on the male and a band on the female. And then you want to be able to see tell which one you're seeing later in the season because the bands we put on have very small numbers on them. You, you can't read them at a distance. Whereas the larger colored bands that have a much small, a more visible number, it might be like a B3 or something. It's not a, a seven or eight digit number. So you could say the green band B3 is the female and the the red, the green band before is the male or, or whatever, then that's primarily what it's useful for people observing at nests or other locations. And with photography, the way it is now, I mean, people take photographs all the time of nesting birds and it, it's useful for that. Uh, but I, I have not had the need for it uh, with what I'm doing. Good question again. And let's see here. Okay. I'm surprised to see so many ungloved hands in these photos. <laughs> These birds have sharp talons and beaks. Are they relatively calm while they're being held? Oh, no. <laughs> um, the, the reason we don't wear gloves is that if you wear a glove, uh, I, I'm going to jump up to a red-tailed hawk. If you wear a glove that the red-tailed hawk cannot penetrate, and falconers have them, or rehabbers, or educators, or whatever, uh, if you wear a glove that, that thickness, you have no dexterity in your fingers to, to write down data, put a band on the bird and crimp it on with pliers or whatever, you lose all dexterity because the glove would have to be so thick. 
Uh, and I, you know, I, I know people that have done that. Um, the way we operate, the, the only time we ever wear gloves is if it's cold out, we're trying to keep our hands warm. And then we usually take the gloves off when we're handling the birds. What you have to do, you learn by experience, you have to learn to handle them and get those legs and feet under control very quickly. So you learn if they're in a mist net or there's some other kind of trap, you have to learn to say, press down on the hawk on the back of the hawk to kind of clamp it down to the ground, not injure it, of course, but press it down onto the ground and then take your other hand and reach up and grab the legs firmly, as you saw in some of those pictures, like the picture of me holding the red-tailed hawk and, you know, in one hand and taking the photo with the other. Um, that's the first thing you want to do is get those legs under control, especially on the larger hawks, because they can really hurt you. The, uh, the, the caveat here is that the falcons all of whom bite their prey and snap its neck, they not only like to grab you with their feet, but they like to chew on you with their beak. So if you hold the legs, uh, you're now putting your knuckles at risk of merlins, particularly. And uh, we all joke that merlins, you know, they're they're all knuckle biters. They they bite and bite your cuticles. Uh, I have plenty of pictures of that. So, uh, but, you know, you learn to live with it. Gosh, well, it sounds like you have to be pretty brave to take on raptor banding. <laughs> Well, that is all we have time for today. Um, Paul, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. The photos, the data, everything was so fascinating. I just want to thank everyone else for um, tuning in today. Um, TNC's next webinar is going to be held on March 16th. We are co-hosting this webinar with um, New Jersey Audubon, and we will be discussing how to create pollinator gardens at home. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, be sure to keep up to date with us on social media for upcoming events, and we will see you next time. Thank you again, Paul. That was awesome. Thank you.